if I like the light this way, but hey, there it is, right? Um, morning, everybody. Welcome. Eight o'clock, uh, my time, seven o'clock on the West Coast. Um, I think most people are recovering from last night, which is just fine. Um, today, we're going to be talking about um, breaking the myths uh, regarding land race. And we'll see if we can't destroy six of those myths. A little bit of sage here that uh, my thoughts might come clear. And uh, we keep it in a piece of abalone shell. Oh, may pod may ad may own. I have both screens going on the dual cast here from my personal channel as well. Um, so, again, good morning. Uh, happy winter to you almost. We're going to be there soon. And uh, let's see, I want to touch on folks might not know who I am, and uh, I'm kind of a nobody, but I'm also somebody who's been around for a minute. Um, I started playing with Land Race in 1986. It was bag seed uh, from Mexico, brickweed. That's kind of what um, everything we have today began with somebody else's bag seed from somewhere around the world. Um, we have all these awesome modern strains today. And um, let's see, they all were bred over time, primarily in rudimentary, smaller environments by people who are extremely passionate about cannabis as uh, medicine and herb and stuff. Um, and stuff comes from all around the world and intermixed to get what we have today. And we're still in the early inceptions of um, really breeding. We haven't got into real breeding yet. It's, it's coming, right? Um, but we're still on these rudimentary stages of what is cannabis. Um, one of the things we're at right now with breeding, though, that I see is it's like, okay, so we're in breeding for straight THC, right? Um, and I hear people talking about utilizing colors as a metaphor, talking about being an artist. I don't know if any of those people actually use paint as an art form, because when when uh, we take all these different colors and we keep mixing them together, we end up with something called mud. And mud is just like this ugly brown, gray, muddled everything. You can't discern. There's nothing beautiful about it. It's just kind of like everything gets mixed together. Right. And so we're sort of there with, with poly hybrids. Right. Um, so let's see. What's what's the first myth? I'm going to hit six myths of cannabis. One of them being, um, you know, you hear me talking all the time, praise on people saying, hey, y'all out of you know, I'm breeding land race. And I'm, I'm specifically talking to people who are, are breeders who, who want to really understand and master the plant. If you're a small grow in your in your in your closet or you, know, you have a four or six plant count, a lot of these things that we classify as land race are not going to be to your best interest unless you really just like want to uh, have a better understanding of the plant. Okay. Um, and, and so uh, there, there's a huge disparity there. You know, if, if you really need some medicine and you're sick, searching those plants isn't going to be the thing for you to do. It's going to be uh, more along the lines of if you know somebody else who has searched them that can find something and or so so um, another another you know I mentioned in the introduction you know it, it is young uh, initiates to the plant and we learn about what a land race is it becomes this mystical thing to us in the far off lands and places that are hidden from us from corporate media here in the West, right? We don't know, we don't know anything about the cultures that these plants come from. We don't know, we're, we're told to be afraid of people from foreign lands and quote unquote, third world countries and stuff. Um, and, and, you know, time is changing, the world's getting smaller through internet and all that. Um, so so uh, when the word land race gets used and, and, um, and here's five myths right here, there's, very different things included in that word. And a lot of people will debate me on this and some people who we should be able to have great conversations with, with this because I include wild plants as land race. And in my classification, I call those true land race. They're the origins of the base genetics of everything. 
Okay, so then we can debate about, well, there's feral and there's wild and if there's any wild and all that stuff. Let's just leave that aside and just understand that, yes, there are plants growing wild, whether they originated there or feral, right? And then we definitely have plants that are feral. We have mountainsides of feral. Then we have the stuff that is grown as a crop. Okay, so these are different things that people can classify as a land race. And, and so in the mystical mindset of the initiate that has the wherewithal to travel the world, they think I'm going to go find myself some base genetics and breed with them or have them for smoke. And they might go find a wild plant someplace and bring it home and try and grow it. And it's not anything at all like what we would have in a dispensary or what you would share with your friend for so many reasons, right? It hasn't been bred for structure. It hasn't been bred for uh, for the chematography. It hasn't been bred for all these other things that we like is a nice high or this, that, or the other thing. Um, but what that plant is good for, though, is whatever traits it does exhibit as a dominant could be reinserted into these polyhybrids that were lost, okay? So, so those plants aren't necessarily going to be something that somebody grows normal um, for, for a home grower and things like that, unless you really want to understand the plant better and all its dynamics. Um, the wild and the feral, those, those are definitely, you're not going out looking for that stuff as a home grower. Um, we get into those plants that are, that are um, domesticated and they're in the field and um, these are still fairly rough plants, even here. Um, and, and I'm going to break this in. I've come up with a new classification here at this point. And, and so we have these domesticated land race, but we also now have these new domesticated land race, the new field crops. Okay. So the original through whatever warfare, um, eradication and um, anthropomorphic translocative genetic pollution right? There is multiple, the, the, the old original land race may or may not be in place as a domesticated crop. And so the overall accepted term for land race in the greater community would be these plants that are planted in the same fields by the same community as uh, selected as an heirloom where they're just picking the best plant over time, right? And might be open pollinated and then it might be interspersing with these plants in the wild, okay? The feral and or wild plants. Right. So that, that would be the, the original old land race I like to refer to. But now I'm, I'm come up with this new term. It really just popped into my head in the last 24 hours, maybe. And what it, uh, is the, the new the new land race. And I sort of this comes from when I was studying, doing field science, um, um, botany, primarily in studying the, the effects of wildfire on, on natives versus uh, introduced uh, uh, species. Right. And there was a term utilized. And they called them new endemics. And this were the plants that were brought in that dominate California's landscape now uh, when the Spaniards brought cattle over, right? And they were stuck in their hooves and it was stuck in their in their fur and whatnot, but completely changed the plant regimes of the West Coast. Um, translocative, so, so anthropomorphic translocative genetic pollution, right? And that's one that my mentor taught me. And if you break it down, it means people carrying seeds around and, and messing up the original land race and other places. Um, so let's see. Um, free stream in here. Let me catch myself again. Um, the new the new land race, right? Okay. So, um, and, and so there's, there's the wild, there's the feral, there's the field, there's the new field, right? And so, but then when we're like a small closet, you've got plant counts, you've got restrictions or whatever it is, we got this category that, that when I say you need to grow some land race, this is where we're getting to. And then when I say you can find some really amazing land, race, this is the cultivar inbred lines of land race, okay? And so that would be things like where if I got it right, Mel Frank bought a bag of weed from a Humboldt. No, I'm sorry, a Amsterdam just, uh, coffee shop. Long time ago, it was labeled as Durban poison. It was field weed grown in a traditional area in South Africa, right? That was smuggled into Amsterdam. Okay, and there's still 
still smuggling. I just watched a video last night about 40 tons of hashish that was busted this past summer coming from Africa to Spain in multi-million dollar sailboats. And they literally had, I'm going to put this on my personal channel uh, linked. It, it, it had big ass freaking bales of one kilo hash packages and um, flower of the countryside for y'all. That's a new term we can employ for land race um, is that's how they labeled in Arabic, all these hash bales. And I got a little lesson today myself, flower of the countryside. So, um, and that, that's probably stuff coming out of Morocco, right? Uh, North Africa. Um, terrible ways to see. Uh, so, so we have these, these, um, we have a high access right now through internet uh, and, and globalization getting smaller and everything with the, what we call the, the new land race. And there's also um, people who are going around collecting feral and uh, wild specimens for us to have access to. And so if you're going out and you say, hey, I want to check this land race stuff out and see what the attributes are, you really need to be aware of these different categorizations or levels of domestication. And for the average Joe, you really want to find somebody who's refined that, like, like that Durban. So, so the story goes, Mel, Mel got, if I got this right, and I, I just heard from secondhand from somebody else and I didn't even go back to review to make sure I got the right names. So, but he took those seeds out of the bag. He refined them a little bit. He, you know, he ran them and he found, I don't even know how many generations he, he before he handed some off. Right, and somebody else got a hold of them. So these are all famous names from back in the day, and this is how all the shit we got today came around. Was these guys were going around finding bag seed? They weren't necessarily original. Some people were traveling to those places, but it was going to be the exact same thing. They're taking a a field seed versus a bag seed, right? They're they're just collecting it uh, directly, and these things were inbred by people who are passionate about it, and it's the same, no different from cabbage and broccoli and all these things that we now have these diverse foodstuffs all come from a wild mustard plant okay you would not recognize wild mustard plant for a cabbage or a broccoli or a brussels sprout yeah well, would we? um and then I, I don't like eating mustard greens at all i love eating cabbage right so so um it, 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 it's the same process here. Um, so the hardest work you're going to have is taking a wild plant and trying to domesticate it, especially without crossbreeding into other varietals. Okay. Um, there's definitely, you know, I've mentioned before, what are the different things we might want to find in these more wild plants that we're going to stabilize? One of the biggest things that you're going to find is all of them are going to be hermaphroditic. All these wild plants have their survival strategies 100% in the feral plants, as well as the domesticated land race. Okay. Um, I'd even say the new land races are going to have this. Once you get something that's been refined and cultivated and inbred into a uh, proper lineage that's still designated a land race, such as Durban Poison. There should not be that intersex issue at that point. That stuff should get bred out. And when that happens, though, I've pointed out on all sorts of the breeding things, we are selecting against a particular thing. There's other stuff that's attached to that. And so there's we're going to lose some attributes of that wild plant, right? Um, but those are the ones that if you're a small, small-time operator, you have plant counts and things like that, you want to taste and see, or if you're just getting into breeding, you want to see if you can't find these more refined cultivars inbred of land race, right? Now, rarely there's people like me who will actually do these um, inbred cult, uh, cultivars where we actually maintain a semi-open pollinated status of this, where we'll select a couple of three females and a couple of three or four males that uh, have the attributes that we're looking for, or hopefully. The hardest thing about it all without having uh, access to the laboratory is... Um, is knowing where that intersex lays, right? And so standard, if you're just doing a one-to-one -one, uh, inbred selection and, and refining a genetic, it could be five, easily five generations to get from 
a feral or a, a field strain into a inbred cultivar. Okay. Um, um, I think you can take stuff that's more close to wild and cross it into polyhybrids that are refined, especially if you have something you want to reestablish, for instance, a stem strength or a terpene profile. Okay. Um, one of the things that occurs though, the high THC levels of our polyhybrids are a basically a stack of um, recessives and double recessives that allow that to happen. Okay, so they're they're you're not going to come back with a super strong THC level when you do those initial crosses. There's going to be all sorts of bizarre things, and you really you know, if, if you're someone like me who does these crosses and you release something like that, you need to make sure people know that's what they're, they're going to be pheno hunting, not necessarily just planting um, at different stages. So some of my stuff is going to be more refined and some of it's less refined. If you're looking at my particular genetics, for instance, and I do my best to point out what stages of things are at. Um, anyone ever wants to know, please feel free to hit me up and ask, well, where are these at in, in the journey? Um, it takes a lot of work. And today, just um, selling off flour or, or hash from the process of breeding, they ain't covering the cost of doing what it is to do all that work. And it's, you know, people's like, oh, do what you love. And it's like, okay, so there's process, all that process. Okay, there's there's all all of the process involved in it. Sometimes it literally is work to get to where you love. Okay, um, checking against checking against the uh, environment and stuff. Checking against. Well, I mean, one of the hardest parts of the job is is testing testing the 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 chemistry through smoke and. If you got a, a dozen is is hard, 25 or 30 is really hard. And going through and gauging is like, am I, is this the one I want to pursue and why? Right. Uh, that That's, that's, <laughs> um, sometimes, you know, you get the wrong combination and testing and, and it's six hours later, you miss most of the day because you just woke up again. Right. Uh, and people don't understand the, the, the trials and tribulations that can occur. Um, so let's see. Um, what kind of stuff would you get from a wild plant, for instance? And well, again, that's going to differ differ for from around the world and where it originated, right? And where it was collected. And and um, so so something that's growing uh, feral, for instance, in um, the uh, walking corridor uh, of the Hindu Kush versus something that's growing wild in Manapurna. You get extremely different plants, right? But these are different. These both have it, right? Um, we've just got a 70 mile an hour wind, ripped all the snow off my roof. That's cool. Um, Testing in progress. Nice. Blowing smoke in Cali. Excellent. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry. I got distracted by the wind. Uh, I love energy. So that's, that might be something that we're looking for is, you know, as, as time progresses, we see like, what did I mention earlier here? There was like 30 something tons of, of hash was seized by Spanish authorities, right? This summer. Okay. in sailboats. People in America uh, are going to be like hit with this big, huge up and comings when we have international trade comes through, All right? We, we we got all this back back pile of flour and stuff, and and um, and, and grown in these these multi million dollar facilities, and we're going to be competing with with uh, literally poor ass dirt farmers who, who live all around the globe, right? And and international uh, corporations with, with oil tankers full of this stuff. And it's kind of how it was back in the 70s and 80s when before we really had Northern California cranking it. Um, it was just getting dumped on us from around the world for super cheap, right? And the for instance, the difference back in the day for brickweed out of Mexico versus um, the chronic out of the triangle 
early nineties, you were paying $600 a pound third hand over the border and $600 got me two ounces. Right. And that's, that's the reality that's going to hit folks. So if you're not breeding with this land race to be able to make it a lot fucking cheaper to grow right in your back, you know, in your dirt farm, you're going to have to have some marketing scheme to keep <clears throat> rich people buying it. Okay. Besides quality, right. The quality is always going to sell. So for instance, where, what, what, what's one of these wild plants going to do for you? Um, it's been dropping down into 20. I think uh, we might've had one 16 degree night out here and I've got there's still three seedlings from my Hindu Kush reproduction project and they're growing fine. Okay. I did because I wanted to test them, not for my locality. I know it can drop down to 10 here for a month and, and they'll be done, but for other locations that hover at the edge of freezing. So I went ahead and threw them into my cold frame is to, um, and, and, and propped up a bunch of bags of leaf around them to maintain, keep the soil from freezing hard and see if I can't keep things on, on a, a location that may be a little lower in elevation, a little further south, but just touches on freezing in the winter. Um, and these plants, these seedlings are going to survive. They'll drop a taproot and you can dry farm them and you won't have to pay for, for irrigation, for instance. Um, okay, so that's a huge one. These, these plants grow naturally without irrigation, right? There's a huge one, and that there's there's a myth destroyed is that you have to water your plant. Here in here in Utah, where we're in extraordinary drought, um, I've let hemp plants grow from seedless way in less than two inches of rain all summer during the growing season, and harvested two two fodder crops, cutting them off for plant for for animal feed, and then a full seed crop. Okay, and we didn't get rain until the seed was all set and everything. That is something that that uh, one of my proteges, Robin, just mentioned that that uh, he had a Tajiki stand that I produced um, and his dry farmed it, and it was pretty funky. They had essentially two inches of rain in, in California this past season. They had ten inches on in like ten days, so it's all overland flow, and you really don't have that much water. Um, he said it had some problems growing; it was really funky, but it ran long. That's a particular one that never really seems to go past cloudy when I grow it. Um, this is one of those typical north latitude, high elevation, narrow leaf strains um, that we talk about where there's diversity in sativa and indica and confusion. And those are whole other episodes I'm going to get to after I get done with this land race stuff again. Um, but uh, he says, you know, it is extraordinary extreme drought all summer where he's at in California. But then the October rain came and the thing just blew up and started growing and produced flour so heavy that it, he was starting to think he needed to um stabilize it right so some water does does help but you don't need to have three inches a week that's just especially if you're able to get the tap route down root down so that's one of the major things that i i believe in that people should be back breeding for is tap roots um everything's grown from clone and and in the um, what do we have in a uh our little micro laboratory or breeding space where our nursery right and people use the plastic bag and paper towel nursery for these perfect conditions and they'll set the temperature and everything right so you have so you can get that genetic potential out for the things that we're selecting for which allows means we're selecting against and so that that totally uh germination rates and and uh, success and uh, uh, all those things are lost when we um breed that way and so so as we move forward into a larger industry and freedom, you're going to want to have access to be able to field plant for hash. It's just straight up tops for flower, milking flowers, bottom for hash, or even just refining that higher dollar hash production into our, our, our more stringent controlled environments that we utilize. Um, working with Reefermans, Aaron Jensen and chat, working with Reefer. Cambodian haze and a seeds Lebanese sativa have to grow indoors in the lab is and the Lebanese is semi auto flow. Yeah, no, this high some of those are definitely no, it's it's interesting. And, and so this is um this is this is the reality of it, you know. A breeding isn't taking perfect pedigrees and crossing them. That's I mean, it is, but it isn't. That that that's just 
eventually you end up in mud with the palette of color. Okay. And so taking these, these exploring these various directions and finding something that not only works for you, other patients, um, it's not just this muddled high TAC thing. I mean, it's none of this stuff is going to probably be above 20, 24%. You, you, there, there's definitely hash plants that are hitting 24% plan, uh, percent that come from, from field stock, right? Um, especially if you grow it in, in, in our specialized systems and everything. That's another huge difference is, is how you grow these. Some of them do not do well with intensive feeding programs. Some of them really prefer and need to have something like latent system with the horizontal, right? That's perfect for testing land race, right? The, the whole system is going to go into to a more difficult uh, rooting structure for it to access. It's going to have bizarre watering layers and stuff. I know some people think that's a great system. I think it's great for utilizing uh, rudimentary genetics that, that don't need to, uh, the, that are used to working harder. And that's my personal experience and and understanding of that system and, and these plants, right? So, but but yeah, a lot of times these these raw genetic coming out of out of a field uh, as a refined land race uh, from cultivar or the new cultivars even still might not do so well with the head intensive feeding program, and it'll cause them to herme or even not flower well. Um, so so looking at their their natural once they've been refined and cult into cultivars. That's a whole nother story because that refining process is all done utilizing these modern systems of feeding and such, right? For the most part, right? If you're going to do more than a few plants, it's, it's really, 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 really hard to be working without a massive um, capital venture behind you to, to do hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of stems and soil, right? And moving the pots around alone, mixing the soil alone, it all takes huge amounts of process which we can refer to as work that we love um so so yeah so a wild wild plant you get seeds from around the world from somebody who goes out and collects wild plants we found this to be the case and hopefully uh, people hear that, that we need to um actually grow those seeds as close to where they're collected wild or feral into a reproduction in a more modern system um I've been sent seeds from wild plants around the world and, and just, they do not germinate for whatever reason, whether it's the pH, whether it's, you know, there's so many things that could go into um, the possibility, but you know, they've got the solid hard rocks to them and everything. Um, so the world, the world war II hemp in Cal Oklahoma, I understand was derived from Chinese hemp when we had actual scientists working for the government um, breeding some hemp. Um, and so that's, that's the majority. They had already kind of eradicated hemp and then they brought in seed stocks for, <coughs> um, uh, for the war. Um, and that, so that seems to be what, um, where that originates. So here's, here's one myth I'm going to destroy. People say, and I believed it for the longest time until I found this one, but, but there are no North American land race, right? And across the board, that seems to be quite true, but there was uh, some property owned since the King of Spain granted it to this particular family in uh, Eastern New Mexico, Rocky Mountain Panhandle, right? And so I've come into the seed. I, I'm not sure if there's anyone else has this out there, but... I call it New Mexico land grant, old Spanish land grant, and uh, Garcia Fernando. Okay, so the best we can tell, Garcia Fernando is the man who owned the property in New Mexico, granted to his ancestors from the King of Spain in 1700. And so in 1971, 72, when Nixon uh, uh, put forth the edict that all cannabis in the United States should be eradicated, he said, this stuff has been here. It's part of the land. It's part of my heritage. And so his grandson is who I access, uh, accessed uh, a pack of, of he collected off the side of the mountain. And uh, his words were, it smokes good. It grows all over the mountain. Rocky mountainside just pops out of the ground. And on wet years, it's everywhere. And on dry years, it just grows out of the arroyos and, and rills and, and gullies. And uh, smells like a fucking skunk. It's um, a very racy, uplifting 
morning type of thing for me when I smoke it and uh, extremely hermaphroditic. Um, it's not blowing balls everywhere, but in that early stage of flowering. And so I'm refining and working those out. And right now I'm, I'm at the third stage of refinement on those. And I've released some, some feminized seed for that for people. Um, oddly, people have been screaming for it for a while and nobody's jumped on it yet. Um, but yes, this is uh, what I believe to be a true North American land race that is not a hemp derivative. Um, I believe it to be, or should we say, before the legal definitions of hemp applied to the chemistry of the hemp plant. So some of the, this I think is common knowledge but may not be understood well by younger folks that, that before prohibition hemp could have had any string, you know, very, it, it was more defined by the fiber production or the seed production than the chemistry. Um, we can look at the old formulations from 130 years ago, late 1800s in American stock. And they'll use these different names of, of um, trying to picture one of these labels. But there's, there's uh, Indian hemp, there's um, sativa, there's indica on these different labels, right? And so, so I think they were tapping into the CBD. We can also... Look at uh, Shenagasi's original writings from when he was in India and first trying to figure out formulations for treating, uh, I think there was an infant, a newborn baby that was um, ha having seizures um, or, or uh, yeah, seizures it was. And so he, he concocted an um, alcohol extraction of one plant and it worked great for a while. And then he went to another plant because the first one stopped working in, in um, tolerances, right? Um, that was one of the one of the first thing, first observances of tolerance and utilizing different genetics. But um, I seem to think off the top of my head, he was moving between what would we call an indica and a hemp plant on those two. Um, I'd have to re review that, and that's definitely one of the shows I'd like to be putting forth here. Um, but that's a whole other thing that we can be adding into. Right. Like um, these super high THC strains tend to be rather devoid of terpene profiles at times and or other constituents and whatnot. So we can be back crossing in for for terpene profiles, um, minor cannabinoids and things like that. So so that initial F1 cross of whatever polyhybrid or inbred polyhybrid you've got versus these these wild plant strains. So. The wildest, <clears throat> there, there's this interesting curve that occurs with genetic diversity, right? Um, a wild population is going to be uh, quite diverse, right? And the feral population is going to be quite diverse. And, and then you have a little less diversity in the field. And then you have less diversity once we cultivate these, these field plants into a cultivar. Then you start producing polyhybrids and your diversity explodes again. You refine it back into an IBL inbred line and that diversity refines and so you know we're, we're talking somewhat more like a true f1 when we're taking an ibl polyhybrid and crossing it to a field stock right and so you're going to have a if, if you're selecting these these more refined plants you're going to have less <clears throat> in your men mendel square you're going to have less possibilities to choose from right and we can only work with what we can but but my process, basically, I make that F1 cross and then I try and back cross in both directions. Um, it doesn't hurt when you're doing this stuff. If you are able to initially cross in both directions, a lot of times it's not always possible because we're working with a, a, a cut, um, a clone only <clears throat> and things like that. And so so you, you if you're possible to keep <clears throat> observing your back crossing and, and squaring and um, <clears throat> looking at it um, where things happen another one i do to do this properly is it's not just one male and one female you want to take as many as you can possibly handle and, and as we get into commercial breeding projects it's literally going to be you're going to be taking 20 30 males and putting them into that many females right or into a clone and then you're taking 10 to 20 of each of those and looking at the results of those and it's it's not really something we can actually do in a closet well, it's not something I, I struggle with 
if I just did a single project at a time, um, I could probably do the numbers and the thousand, you know, 3000 stems of a single project, right. And keep it all teeny small. And, and I'm working on the parameters that I am able to work in. Um, it's, um, yeah. So, so, but this, this is all stuff that needs to happen. And I pointed out in previous discussion, we, we look at the, the fellow who's breeding poinsettia is doing the exact same thing that most cannabis breeders do where they go and they find somebody else's work right? They find what appeals to them and they take that and they do a sexual cross of those and create a new sexual progeny that is a novel new genetic mix, right? And he says, clearly we have a problem. We've got basically two or three original plants that we've bred all these from. And this is something else. If you look at the original plants they started with that were, they, they were somewhat cultivated by the Aztecs, right? And so we call them a land race. And they had been refined to a point, but now we go to the store and the, the point was like they had to manipulate the plant to produce or put several in a single pot to get that. And this was like a hundred years ago or whatever it was um, to get that to look like a bundle of flowers. Right. And now we have these ones that literally you put one flower in the pot and, and it explodes out in this massive color. OK, so we can do these parallels with with the cannabis so well, because. It's the same kind of thing. A wild or a field plant is going to be a bit scragglier than than this refined flower we're looking for smoking. Something to touch on, though, is those scraggly field plants are actually what you want for producing hashish. OK, those trichomes are going to be accessible when you shake them and, and a dense, hard nugget that we PGR and have bag appeal for is not necessarily the best thing because you have to crush that entire rock up to get to the trichomes on the inside if they even were able to develop fully um so so the poinsettia guy he totally inbred he's, he's observed that we've completely inbred these th basically three genetics into each other multiple times and but all all of that potential was there right all the potential for that ability to produce that big massive bloom was always in the original land race that they selected from. It just took the amount of selection and lining up those genetics to produce these double recessive expression. So the same, same kind of stuff goes on with the cannabis. And so what, and we listen to that, because they had a study, a story, he says, well, we've run into this massive problem in breeding. We've lost all resistance to white fly in our commercial production facility you know, uh, models. And he went back into um, in New Mexico, where, where somebody has, has under lock and key all the old Aztec veritals, and they have white fly resistance. Okay, so that's the same thing. Why one of the major reasons I'm, I preach about land race um, is disease resistance, um, lost medicinal profiles. I've touched on one of the other pro guy says he traveled the world, found a wide, uh, a wild plant, took it home and grew it. And it was racy as if I he couldn't, it was too much for him. He had to give him anxiety, right? Well, that's definitely not necessarily something that the average uh, recreational consumer wants, but it's definitely something that is a lost medicine for somebody who needs a metabolism stimulant. Okay. And so the, all these, all these things that we're looking for, for recreation, are going to outbreed and exclude the things we're looking for for the actual medicine, the lost medicines. The so so when I'm working with some of these, I necessarily will I will necessarily will take the scraggliest looking, least commercially viable plants, and I'll breed them to see what comes out of it. I'll cross it to something else to see what comes out of it. Okay, and that's where if you see um, purple mutant chitril in some of my genetic, right? That was the narrowest, scrawniest looking, um, scraggly, barely even had any fluorescence at all. And I had to use tweezers to get any pollen out of it. Okay, um, it wasn't going to. It wasn't going to pollinate anything without me really tweaking it. That's not something any commercial operator is going to ever look at. But what resulted when I crossed it to something was the largest cola I had ever gotten in a three gallon pot. OK, <laughs> and so not just the hybrid vigor, but there was stuff from that cultivar having been inbred 
the the it kind of started repressing itself on on its expression capacity and the the recessives and stuff were able to just explode once they got that that hybrid uh, position right so these are some of the things um, um I'm, I'm gonna recap we have we have wild land race right or wild plants that i categorize as, wild, as land race and other people will not okay so i there's no need for contention on that it's Utilizing words to communicate is all we need to do. Okay, and agree to disagree. So we have we have wild or native plants. We have we have feral that are plants that were planted and went back in, and these things all can integrate the feral to the wild. All right, and so that's where people will say, "Well, there's no such thing as wild anymore because pollen has blown about or been translocated by humans." Okay, so then we have the field cultivars that that is the traditional term usage of land race it's mostly applied when people utilize it okay so but the word land race can be used uh, deleteriously or out of context or um, confusedly to mean all these stages right and so unless you clarify what somebody means in conversation you're going to be going boom 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 no it's not you don't want to grow that you don't want to grow right and it's like no you actually do want to grow land race it's which one of these stages do you want to grow um, and are you capacitated towards? All right, so we've got our field and the field can be mixing with the, with the wild and it can be mixing with the feral, depending on proximity and wind and weather patterns, right? And then we have our, our, uh, our new cultivars, our, our new land race. I'm, I've just come up with this term and that's the stuff that's definitely been interbred. People sending seeds to them and it's mixing around and, and they've, Got some hybridized stuff, uh, you know. So, so like Jamaica, the the folks, uh, uh, Aaron, uh, Arn, I'm sorry, Arjun will will tell us that um, Jamaica, being such a small area, the pollen from the new poly hybrids came in and overtook all of the dominant land races in that small area, and so now we have these new land races. Okay. Um, and the originals might still exist in somebody's collection. Okay, and as somebody who does preservation. All right, so so the best and first thing you should do if you get a hold of some wild seed and you have the capacity to do anything with them is a preservation run. And that literally means you're just taking everything and growing it and open pollinating it and allowing it to grow. Then you have this massive seed stock of all of that genetic information and it's been expanded. And so you can see at different corners of what's available when you open those up or you send them out to other people to do things with. But just killing the plant because it didn't meet the expectations of your mysticism, um, to me is a sin. <laughs> um, but again, that's my mysticism. Okay, I'm, I'm a creation protectionist. I'm not a, a fundamental, fundamental creation type, but I believe that whether it took three billion years or six days to create all this, it's way bigger than us to be greedy and destroy out of our own laziness and, and desires and such. Um, so yeah, again with the, with the feral, the same thing. And again, with, with when you get into the ones that were that were in a field, right, and we have access to those, I think I think you can do a combination there where because we're still going to have. Uh, intersex issues uh, and undesirable. We're just still going to have some scraggly plants and whatnot, um, but you're getting a lot closer to that refined plant that we want. And, and depending on whether you just, we're going to use that for a hash plant or if you want to refine it into a flower plant, you're still probably going to want to do a, a open pollination expansion. At the same time, you can select cultivars for inbreeding, right? And then moving forward into that inbred cultivar that you can then utilize for F1 polyhybridizing and or present as a inbred specific land race cultivar that people can utilize for breeding or, or uh, for its particular aspects, right? <laughs> Amy, aim your self-love away from eyes in the future. That must be something to else in there. Um, so yeah, when, when, again, the, the home grower, you're looking for those refined cultivars. You're not looking for the wild stuff, not necessarily looking for the field stuff. <clears throat> People who uh, have an operation and want to have something unique, that uh, field stuff might be the place to start. 
right? Because the cultivars, the inbred cultivars have been around quite some time already and have been utilized. Um, I mean, land restraints are thriving. In the, yeah. So again, there, there's, there's some places where there are still unadulterated genetics, but without having access to them, we can only conjecture. Right. And, and so it's been, it's been 20 years. The, you know, my, my, my mentors passed on, but, but he was traveling in the seventies and eighties walking the hippie trail and, you know, just like Arjun, they didn't, nobody knew back then what the pollution of genetics was going to do. And that's why a lot of folks from back then became land race preservation enthusiasts because they realized, oh, I fucked up. I traveled the world with my poly hybrids from, from the States. And I traded those to the locals for the best of their local stuff. And I polluted their local stuff. So yeah, there, there may and may not be those wild, those populations in, in situ still. Um, yeah, there's a lot of the Pakistani land race. So, so you know, um, Indian land race stream, uh, DPAC is R E N I G, is an amazing resource for a lot of this um, Eastern. Um, so he's, he's primarily uh, North, Northern India and, and Pakistan and, and Eastern Afghanistan, I understand, is where his connections tend to be. Um, but there's other people, um, um, Angus, he's got a bunch of great work as well. Right. Um, <clears throat> these, uh, sweet things that come out. Yeah. No, Wayne P. That's exactly what I'm talking about. The new, the new land race. It happens. Um, yeah. So, so there, there's a whole, there's a whole no, uh, a whole new, um, mindset so there's people riding the hide horses that, 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 that want to call call me out and say i don't know what i'm talking about don't know who i am don't know anything about the you know i've, I've been doing this since the, the mid 80s just kind of on my own on the side and you know i ain't after commercial um um sticker etc um there's a lot of people who say don't do this you don't want to do land race you don't want to and it's like no they don't want to do that Open your mind and see where your future lies, and um, what the possibilities are. So the, there's 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 plenty of uh, room to create new varietals, new speed, new and all sorts of stuff. And and even um, like someone says, the rude skunks getting uh, uh, a rude, Rudy Ruder Alice, not my rude skunk. Then that's rude skunk was somebody else's actual um, hybridization of of. Ruderalis land race to skunk. And then I just took it to the next level and created a feminized from it. Okay. These are all different things that actual breeders do. And then part of it's uh, explore. And, and like, if all I did was take other people's stuff and cross it um, and, and, or, or reproduce it to me, that's unethical, right? Doing it on a side project because I'm preserving it and, or I want to see what it does or feminizing things that weren't feminized by the original breeder. These are, these are all different ways where you're not really stepping to somebody's toes. There's definitely people get a hold of my genetics and they're making crosses that I've already made. And I don't mind that so much as long as you're not trying to sell them. Right. Um, um, I'm totally open for people taking all of my work and utilizing it in their work. As long as you give credit where credit's due. And I try to do the very same best. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, to, Yeah. Now, Dennis is talking about the, the anthropomorphic genetic pollution. And yes, today's today's industry is THC driven. But, but realize it's like it's like if the alcohol business was just primarily specifically focused on producing straight alcohol. Right. And you're just drinking Everclear all the time and no alcohol and THC are very different. Yes, this is true. But but the this it's like I like drinking wine sometimes. <laughs> I like drinking beer sometimes. And I, I actually used to make a beer. Uh, I used to beer brew um, uh, two to three batches a week for years and years and years. I used to drink in huge amounts of alcohol. Um, I never liked being drunk. I really enjoy the flavors, right? Um, at some point you get a little numb. I, my toe, I can't feel my toes. That ain't cool, right? And it's kind of the same thing with, with cannabis. But, but like um, there was for several years, I brewed something I called a breakfast beer. 
And it was uh, basically a Belgian white with about 2% alcohol in it. And this was before I moved to Utah, but I literally poured that shit on my cornflakes and ate it for breakfast. Okay. It's just, um, there's different people like doing different things. And so, so I, I, I kind of, if it wasn't for having charred my lungs firefighting, uh, you know, I burned over and without a shelter, 80 foot flames for 10 minutes one time. There, there's several others where, you know, my ears were melting off the side of my face and shit. Um, but you breathe a lot of fucking smoke. And uh, so I, I prefer to just take a little bong hit and um, that's all you need. Right. Uh, but I also really, really enjoy the flavors of cannabis and smoking. And so that, that, you know, without, without dealing with, with the coughing and, and such. So we, here we have dabbing and, and we have the, those flavors. So sometimes I, I've, I've got a plant that I call hippie crack because I just want to keep smoking. The flavor is so divine and, and, and it rolls off your tongue as you exhale it. Right. Um, and luckily it's not a super high potency plant. It, it has a bit of an uptick in its chemistry. And so I can, I can take five or six bong hits of that and not just pass out. But the majority of my shit anymore, my pain's been fixed. I can't, I can't take five bong hits of 24%. <laughs> Put it in a joint and it's, it, you waste most of it. I, I, I'm packing it in a bowl and puffing it slowly is a little, can, all these produce a different response too, right? If you don't know that, um, similar to drinking wine versus beer versus alcohol. Those also have slightly different chemistries too. And besides the intense volume of alcohol per each brew. Um, all right. So we're coming into the close here. I'm going to go ahead and wind her up. Why, why do we want to breed? We want to bring back uh, with land race. We want to bring back various different attributes that may have been lost through inbreeding and selecting for a particular attribute, which is THC exclusively. Okay. Um, sim strength, disease resistance, um, bug resistance, flavonoids, lost medicinal structure of chemistry all are things that we want to be looking at as a community, uh, a global scale, not necessarily the people who are after dispensary sales of flour and dabs, right? They, they're on their, they're on their journey doing their thing and that's good for them. Um, oh, it would be better for them to not say that they dominate the world's culture and industry and understand that there's like the rest of us who do what we do and places where we do it, which is the most of the world, right? Granted, yes, there's the most money and cash flow that comes out of California and the cannabis industry. And that has a lot to do with the fact that there's a shit ton of money in California to start with. People can afford to buy $90 grams of hash, <laughs> right? Um, so, so, but, but, you know, the majority of the world can't. And it's the same thing I talk about with artwork is the super refined art is, re, is, is like, the dollar wise, it's the greatest amount of artwork sold in the world, but volume wise, it's a freaking drop in the bucket for what's produced every year. It's the same thing with cannabis, right? So, so we've got wild cannabis, which can be referred to as a land race. Some people don't, some people do. And you're in a conversation about land race. You need to refer uh, to or, or go back and ask for a definition as to what it is that you're communicating about. Because a wild land race is very different than an inbred cultivar of land race. And there's a lot of structure in between there and levels of refinement and whether it is something you want to grow or not. Um, again, everything that we have today is derived from these lineages whether they were polyhybridized or hybridized originally before they were refined into cultivars or not, right? There's so all of this is these spectrums of, of flow of, of this refinement. And um, the, this is all we're, we're looking for primary, we're looking for various recessives. And so when you just go and collect, get any of these wild seeds or whatnot, these, these recessives might not even be showing up and you, you have this amazing magical package that you didn't even recognize because you didn't open pollinate it to start with and, and expand the genome to look at the entire thing. Um, so the, the, the wild, feral, field, new field, and, and, and the cultivars of land race, the, these are, 
again, uh, the, the different aspects that you might be discussing when you're talking about a various one. When you go to buy, you want to find out from the breeder which level that is, that it's going to meet and match your goals, desires, and needs. Um, and then the great reward is getting to puff some of this stuff, right? You can't, I know, I see people showing. It doesn't, you can't, you can't. Can you see? Here's some Breath of Red Dragon. Um, this is my F2 selection, but it's it's highly crystallized. There's there's Keith in the bottom of the bag. This is my Dr. Dream All Cure, which is 26 land races mashed up together. And then I'm back crossing them for my Dragon series, right? So you have access to the Dragon series. And they're they're literally in between my mentor, my brother, and I, we have 60 years cumulative three scientists working on the Dr. Dream All Cure to bring it into the current state of cut only that it's at. Uh, and yes, my, my fingers are... This stuff's kind of dry. I left the bag open. I've been testing these. This is this is refined out though. I had 24 different selections out of out of the 70 from this run. Right. I'm down to five in the F2. It takes work. It just there's this what the process requires. And um, blessings on y'all. And yeah, the thing looks dirty. I use it a lot. I've had it for a long fucking time. I clean it once in a while, but there's not enough time in the day to keep it clean and smoke and do everything else. So I'm adapted. And that's all I need for about three hours. Peace out, everybody. Um, gene editing is going to happen. Can't stop it. Shout out to Strong Style Organics, Louis Salazar. His nice. Shout out Robert Bandula Jr. Strong Style again. Foe by foe. Winnie P. Shout out. Dennis Cartes. <clears throat> Robert, Mr. Greenfingers, Thomas. <clears throat> and appreciate everybody in the North joining us today and learn a little bit about land races. Um, I'm going to continue uh, this series. Um, we'll see y'all probably Wednesday morning. It's time for me to sign off. Peace out. Um, ah, I'm going to close out with got a couple of minutes. Let's see here if you can do that. I can see what I'm doing. Templanus, I missed your question there. I'm sorry. I'll get on. We'll talk about some chitrol and some various regions in my land race talks coming up in the future here. I have no idea if this comes over on the radio or on the speakers or not. Feed off. <laughs> Rhythm of the Earth.
o'clock. See y'all later. Boom.